Hey there, Drew here. So this is a video uh, going out to my sister. I don't know if it'll help or not, but uh, something's going on where my niece is being redeployed to Afghanistan. She's in the military. She's been there a few deployments already, and she's going back, and she's had some troubles. Um, so this is my uh, video to help my sister and maybe anybody else since nobody's really watching my videos anymore. Uh, give her a sense of uh, why why they're there, why these young people are in this hellhole. Because uh, the issue of Afghanistan goes back a long, 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 long time. Um, but the main thing that's uh, the issue of Afghanistan is, I'll put the picture up right here, drugs. Since the Af uh, invasion, 2001, Afghanistan's become the biggest drug producer in the world, opium, right? It's grown there and protected by the British, mainly, and the U.S. So why the hell are we in a country that's protecting uh, drugs that are financing terrorism? Because that's what drugs are, right? Now... To, to know this, you got to go back quite a ways. Um, mainly, the start of this goes back to the creation of the modern British Empire. In the sense of uh, the 1768 period, when the British defeated the Continental Powers in that war, Seven Years' War, and you had the transform transformation of England from a backward feudal monarchy into the modern corporate state, which it's today, which is a takeover of the Venetian party, which is what it's called, the Bank of England, and the East India Company as the ostensibly company, or the company that essentially went out and conquered and, and so forth. So, um, And, of course, uh, the issue was the control of the sea routes, right? They had this vast empire. They needed to have these sea routes so they could carry out their, their operations, which were largely about southern states grown cotton, bringing to England, transforming into cloth with cheap, of course, slave labor, then taking the cloth to India, uh, trading it for opium, Right, because uh, India at that time was the biggest drug plantation in the world, and in the process they had to kill ten, tens of millions of people, and then taking that to China and then forcing them at gunpoint to take the opium, killing tens of millions in the process. So that was the British Empire, and they had a problem because they had the Russians on the north, and they were extending their empire south, and that was a threat to the jewel of the empire, which is India. So, so the British, uh, through a guy called Helfred Mackinder, came up with a policy called geopolitics, which is about, you know, creating a chessboard, right? Running the, chess, the world like a chessboard. And I'll put the book up here. Right? Great Grain, uh, The Great Game, Struggle for Empire in Central Asia by Peter Hopkirk. So that's a book you can find most anywhere. And it's a good, pretty good history about the players involved in the control of Southwest Asia, or what people tend to think of as the Middle East. But that's, that's the term the British Empire used. It's really just Southwest Asia. And if you talk about Afghanistan, that's like Central Asia. So that was the situation where the, uh, for a few centuries, the British and the Russians played this, this game over control of Central Asia. Mainly the British acting to save their empire against the Russians. So, um, up to World War I, uh, it goes into a whole different situation then, where 
they go and they break up the Ottoman Empire, which is where all these modern uh, Arab states come from. Is uh, something called the Sykes-Picot Treaty, which the British and the French did to essentially draw all the lines of all the countries that we know today. You know, Qatar, Iraq, Afghanistan, so forth. That was all created in around World War I um, in the breakup of the Ottoman Empire, which was done by the British Empire, by the way. Uh, let's see. And uh, there's this book here, Peace to End All Peace by David Fromkin, which... Um, isn't that good, but it's it does give you a sense of the players, uh, policies of the empire, things going on. Uh, it tells you who the players are at that time. So that's the creation of the modern. Well, it's not modern because these kings, uh, yeah, these these monarchs, the Saudis, right. And then, of course, the creation of the Cold War, and then the what became uh, out of the Arab Bureau of the British Empire, uh, a very famous person called Bernard Lewis. And you might know his students, or ostensibly students, uh, people like Zbigniew Brzezinski, uh, Samuel Huntington, they put out books on the issue of the grand chessboard, the clash of civilizations, and these crazy things that uh, stay that uh, it's just inevitable that the West is going to have this big conflict with the uh, you know, with Islam and Confucianism. Now that's kind of insane, but that's that's the policy of the empire: constant warfare, uh, that kind of thing. You can't have any sort of economic cooperation around beneficial policies mm, can't do that um, yeah Brzezinski in particular during the Carter administration was uh, important in getting Carter to launch the provocations that got the Russians or the Soviets at that time of course uh, into Afghanistan right and then then we had the Operations of the launching the Mujahideen, so we could have, like I said, this these people to fight the Soviets in Afghanistan, and they were trapped there for like ten years, and they got their butt kicked. But uh, at the time, uh, there was this whole neocon network of, uh, uh, they, uh, yeah, these these, let's say, the media, think tanks. Uh, Let's see, you, might, you know I know some of them. Uh, Leo Chern, John Train, a Wall Street banker. Uh, Pat Robertson, Ollie North, of course. That was the famous uh, Iran-Contra operations, drugs for weapons. Um, might not know him, Aga Khan. He's a very, well, I got his picture here anyways. Uh, Daniel Graham of the Heritage Foundation. A lot of these kind of neocons. Uh, free trade think tanks, that kind of thing, were set up to fund pro or promote propagandize for the issue of these Afghanzi, these extremist uh, Muslims, right, in the fight against godless communism. And of course, so once that was done, you had the once the Soviets were defeated and left in Afghanistan, right, you had the then creation of a whole bunch of uh, Islamic terrorist organizations like the GIA, the PKK, which has just been taken off the terrorist list because they're helping us uh, kill people in Iran. Whew. Um, let's see. Yeah, in particular, uh, Bernard Lewis and Brzezinski at that time during this period, I uh, had this policy called the Yarga Crisis, where we're going to stabilize the Soviets by creating all these extremist Muslims and using them against the Soviets. So that's where that all comes from in the modern sense. 
And just just uh, recently, um, Prince Andrew. He's like, I forget who he's, but he's a he's a relative of Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip. He's uh, recently he. I don't know if he became infamous or so forth, but uh, he gave a he was giving a, a speech. This was leaked by WikiLeaks that uh, he, he made a statement at one of the embassies out in in Asia that uh, we're involved in the new great game and we're out to win this time and we're out to win this time so here's andrew and ostensibly it's the issue of oil control of resources and just manipulation in general mainly it's targeting the russians of course yes and of course uh tony blair in 1999 he declared that uh since the Soviets were gone, we've entered the new period where we've had where the era of sovereign nation states. That is finished and gone forever. It's time for the new empire. And uh, I think the Economist had articles about cool Britannia and this is the new empire. Goodbye nation states, right? And and then to. And that, of course, goes into the whole neocon apparatus, the, like I said, the clash of civilizations, the invasion of Iraq, ostensibly with the, because of 9-11, which we know is all a lie. Blair, in particular, who had to kill a guy like Dr. David Kelly in order to get the Iraq war going. And uh, today we have uh, our hapless president, right? whose advisor is Tony Blair, who uses the term humanitarian intervention to say that, well, we have to go into countries that we've destabilized with our destructive economic policies and the terrorists that we're financing to go in there and then overthrow their governments, right? And that's the situation to get today where we just overthrew the Libyan government, right? And now we got these these Al Qaeda lunatics, right? That we support and gave weapons to, who've uh, now murdered our embassy. And of course, we're using them to try to overthrow Syria, which is a problem because the Russians say that uh, since Syria is a client state, and they have a lot of economic investments in there and the military and so forth that they're not going to back up and they're going to defend Syria and this is a threat of conflict of a nuclear type right over Syria so this is a problem so this is the situation where this part of the planet has been this chessboard for centuries ostensibly over like said the British Empire protection of their system of slavery, drugs, uh, all sorts of degeneracy. And that's why I said that uh, my niece shouldn't even be there at all in the first place. And it's nice that John McCain is coming to his senses finally and saying, well, what the hell are we there for anyways? We're not doing anything there. And as I pointed out before, right, there's this huge elephant crapping on your bed, right? We get this drug problem, right? And we're there to protect it. And this is financing the terrorists that, that are shooting at our troops. So, uh, oh yes, and I didn't bring up the Muslim Brotherhood, of course, which has been a problem because that was created by the, by the British and their control over Egypt originally back in 1929. Essentially, again, coming out of the breakup of the Ottoman Empire and the British domination of uh, Africa at that time. So uh, that's a general history. Uh, I hope that didn't go too long, but that's a general history of Southwest Asia and the problems that we face because if you don't take on the issue of why we're there in the first place, you obviously can't solve anything. Right. All right, so that's it. I hope that helped uh, give you a sense of 
the general way, well, the way things have gone there for a while. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's it. Thanks a lot. Thanks for listening, and see you later. Bye-bye.